transition. <laughs> chance to read last week's column. Um, you know, we, we continued with our theme of all the worlds a stage, all the nature worlds a stage, and uh, uh, looking beyond the, uh, the players that take up a lot of the spotlight, looking um, at the kind of the supporting cast, we decided to, to investigate the world of screech owls. Um, and I, uh, I tell you, I, I wrestled with this um, uh, scientific name. In fact, I see I've got a typo there that's supposed to be megascops. Um, I don't know what it is about this bird that is mega. Scops uh, is another reference to owl. Uh, the genus name for this species was Otis ACO. Um, and Otis and ACO are actually uh, two other ways to say owl in Latin and Greek. As if that isn't confusing enough, um, I, I was struggling with keeping the words in the right order. And I thought, why is that? Well, the long-eared owl, which is another owl that um, we have in this area, but only in the wintertime, um, their scientific name is Aceo Otis. So owl, 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 we are talking about owls. We're talking about um, little owls, the screech owls. And I, I wanted to call your attention here uh, to this gentleman, John Hennigan. We'll actually, you're going to be hearing that name a lot in the next few weeks because he has um, he had uh, a lot of fun with screech owls in his yard. Um, we've actually got a couple more columns coming up as we get into spring about John and his adventures with nest boxes in his yard. Um, now, as you recall, um, when we talked about uh, owls in this area before, the screech owls are the smallest of our year-round residents. Um, this is, woman's name is Candy. She runs a uh, rehab center in Rockford called Northern Illinois Raptor Rehab. Uh, they do a lot of programs. I know we've had them out at Hickory Knolls, um, but her gloved hand gives a great size comparison for how the screech owl, the Eastern screech owl measures up to the great horned owl, which is uh, the largest owl in our area. In fact, I think it's the largest owl um, uh, in North America. It's, it's uh, quite large. The females um, especially can be very, very large. Um, but you can see there's some similarities and it often leads to the screech owl being referred to as a baby great horned owl. Now they're, they're uh, not that closely related and we know a, a baby bird looks um, a, a baby bird can uh, look very much like its parents. Um, in fact, if it's flying, it, it's going to look exactly like its, uh, its parents. It's going to be the same size as its parents. So uh, if you see a little tiny owl flying around, it's not a baby. A screech owl is probably a, a baby great horned owl. It's a, uh, a full-grown screech owl. You can see from this picture, too, that they come in two different colors, the gray and the red. Um, and a gray and a red can be a mated pair, as we'll see in another slide. Uh, now, they are uh, being small. Camouflage is their friend. And here we have um, our screech owl uh, at Hickory Knolls. And then here on the right, we have two photos that were also shared by John Hennigan. Um, this is on the top, the, the red screech owl. And down below is the gray screech owl, both of which inhabit uh, his backyard and in fact were a mated pair this past year. Um, the box on the top uh, is actually a screech owl box and you can see it's been uh, kind of dug around on. I don't know if some squirrels or maybe um, uh, some other kind of rodent had tried to uh, enlarge the hole a little wet bit to make their way in. Uh, down below here, this is actually a uh, flicker box. And uh, that's where John's story gets very interesting. I don't wanna give too much away because like I said, we'll be covering that as we get into the, uh, the breeding season this spring, but um, uh, the flicker box is sized uh, similar in size, the, the opening as well as the uh, nest cavity inside is um, the similar in size to what a screech owl's requirements are. Um, you can see on the front though, the uh, flicker, there's a, a couple little um, uh, 
uh, in fact, these, there's maybe five or six of these uh, grooves here in front uh, of the flicker box for a little bit of added traction should it decide to hop its way up before it goes in. Um, so screech owls, are, they're small. Uh, they rely a lot on camouflage for survival. But I tell you, probably the biggest key to their success um, in our area and uh, throughout the eastern United States is their approach to food. They are not picky by any means. They will uh, walk around on the ground and they'll glean uh, beetles. Um, if we have a cicada, uh, big cicada year, they will certainly be feasting on those as well. Uh, moths and crickets, katydids, they're on the menu. Uh, they do consume, especially in wintertime, uh, a fair amount of mice and voles. Shrews, too, are on their menu. Those are the little insectivorous uh, creatures that uh, look a little bit like a rodent, but they're not. Um, bats, when they can get a hold of them. Uh, I think in the column, I related a story uh, of visiting a, a, a mine that had been closed down in southern Illinois, and that mine had become habitat for a number of different bat species. Well, first thing uh, we saw when we walked into the mine was uh, there were a few bats roosting uh, up uh, on the walls and the ceiling, but there were all these bat parts down on the ground, um, wings and kind of headless carcasses really. And, and what that was, was uh, screech owls that had found uh, that rich food source there uh, in the form of bats that were hanging out and were really kind of free for the taking. Um, they'll eat birds. Uh, if there's an area where there's lizards, as we have in the, the southern United States, they'll feed on those. Um, frogs, John, uh, John Hennigan says that he has seen his screech owls feasting on frogs uh, from the pond in the neighborhood. Uh, spiders and worms and crayfish, and I love this, um, the Audubon description mentions that they will also eat many other small creatures. So really, they, uh, they're they very um, adaptable and opportunistic in their diet. So that um, always bodes well uh, when an animal is trying to survive. Now, this little, um, uh, this is a still from a, a, a camera that's on the feeders in Sapsucker Woods, which is part of uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's mess camps. If you visit their YouTube page, you can uh, have your choice of many, many different trail camps that they have set up. Well, this took place um, a little over a week ago. They had a flying swirl come and land on their feeding platform. Well, guess what landed on the feeding platform shortly after the flying squirrel did? That's right, a, uh, a screech owl. Uh, flying squirrels count as small rodents, and that, as we saw, is certainly something that's on the menu. The, the um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of flying squirrels. This did not end well for that particular individual, but the cool thing was that even though the screech owl was um, not that much bigger than its prey, it actually it managed to subdue the squirrel and um, at the end of the video fly off with it. So if you want to check that out, you can just go to YouTube and um, find the Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology's channel and um, Sapsucker Woods Feeder Cam. They've got a, a lot of different parts of that um, uh, archive there that you can, you can go and check it out um, if you want to see the drama in action. <laughs> Uh, now, this was an interesting study that popped up when I was researching a little bit more about the screech owl's diet. Um, now, this does not, we do not have uh, blind snakes or worm snakes in this part of Illinois. Down in uh, southern Illinois, there is a, a small snake called a worm snake. Um, but these blind snakes uh, live in Texas. And the, this particular study date, dates to 1987, but there was, there's been even more recent research that's found that when a mother screech owl, which is what we see here on the left, is bringing food uh, to her brood, she will bring them uh, Texas blind snakes uh, when she's in Texas. <laughs> and um, she will bring, uh, they'll feed on some, but she brings extra and they 
live in the nest and they feed on uh, a lot of the kind of ugly things that can can take up residence and and actually uh, sometimes end up killing the little nestlings, uh, things like uh, bot flies and bot fly larvae. Uh, the blind snakes are um, insectivorous snakes. So they, they screech owl will actually bring some in uh, and, and just let them live in the nest. And they, uh, they keep it neat and tidy. And um, it, it actually, research has shown it increases the success uh, of the, uh, the, the nests that have the snakes living in them have a, a greater rate of success than those that don't. So kind of a cool thing. I was trying to think if there would be any snake around here that would put up with that. And we don't, we don't have any blind snakes around here. We do have some insectivorous snakes, uh, ringneck snakes and brown snakes, uh, smooth green snakes. Um, I don't know if they, they stand to live in a nest, uh, especially with a bunch of things that would might potentially try to eat them, but it's a neat idea. And um, you know, maybe there are some other things that screech owls in this area bring to their nests that help uh, keep things neat. Something I want to check into in uh, the weeks and months and years to come. Now, um, Ted, I know you had written in. Uh, a couple other people were asking about um, what what does it take to host screech owls. Um, in your yard. Well, if you've got uh, a tree that has some natural cavities in it, you're a step ahead of the game because uh, these birds are cavity nesters. Uh, if you don't, you can always put up an owl box and there's many, many sources online. Uh, you can also find plans to build your own. Um, in talking with John about his nest boxes, uh, I asked him you know, what the, the pros and the cons were. Well, he said one thing, he, he keeps a very natural yard and that, that in fact is, is probably a, another big key to the success of hosting screech owls. If you've got uh, some brush piles in your yard that might serve as hiding places for um, mice and voles and shrews, uh, beetles, the, the things that, some of the things that are on the screech owls menu uh, that certainly helps, as does uh, reducing the number of uh, and amounts of, of pesticides that you use, making sure you and none of your neighbors are using um, rodent baits in uh, your house, because that would certainly have an effect on the food that was available to the screech owl. Um, planting native uh, plants and shrubs to kind of create a natural sort of environment. Those are all things that will also help uh, increase the success of uh, having screech owls in your yard. But John said, yeah, you know, there are some things you need to watch out for. Um, starlings in our area are pretty much everywhere and they are cavity nesters too. Um, they will evict uh, screech owls. Sometimes they will set up uh, their nest before the screech owl even has a chance to get going. The thing about screech owls though, is that they're a not, uh, non-native species. So if they start a nest, you can pull it out. You can't do that with our native species because of the Migratory uh, Bird Act Treaty, but the uh, starlings are fair game. And if you pull out the nest material enough, they might just decide to move on. Um, squirrels are certainly uh, attracted to a uh, box that size and a hole that size. Um, sometimes you just end up having to uh, get yourself another screech owl box and keep your fingers crossed. Uh, wasps, um, if they move in, um, if you see them flying around, they're, they're going to be really hard to deter. And if they're in there while the screech owls are training us, they, they will uh, sting them. And sometimes that doesn't uh, end well for the little nestlings that are in the box. So. Um, just it's best to be vigilant uh, if you've got a, a box like that. And if you see a lot of wasps checking it out, that would happen in the springtime. Um, as soon as, as insects start to fly, insects need a temperature of about 50 degrees or more for uh, to be able to fly. So uh, once things start to warm up uh, to that degree, which <laughs> doesn't seem like it's ever going to happen, but um, yeah, keep an eye out for wasps as well. Um, and then uh, make sure you keep your box neat and tidy, especially since around here we don't have uh, Texas blind snakes. 
Now, John recommended this book. So uh, any of you who are looking to uh, learn more about screech owls or become landlords to a pair of screech owls, you might want to check this book out. Um, it's available on Amazon. Um, the Eastern Screech Owl, Life History, Ecology, and Behavior in the Suburbs and the Countryside. So he said there's lots of helpful tips in there for um, uh, attracting the birds and then um, keeping them coming back to your, your yard. Now, um, since we're on the topic of birds, we got a few more bird items uh, we wanted to pass uh, your way tonight. Uh, this past weekend was the Great Backyard Bird Count, which is an annual event. Uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, National Audubon, and then there's also a, a Canadian component to this as well. Um, it actually takes place um, just about everywhere. The idea is for people to just look out at uh, who's coming to their feeders. Um, and it actually doesn't even have to be feeders. If, if they're in your yard, you can count them. Um, you want to uh, only though, when you turn in your data, you only report the greatest number you saw at any one time. So uh, but yesterday I was at uh, Hickory Knolls and there was a red-bellied woodpecker there at the suet feeder. And he flew away and he came back and he flew away and he came back and he flew away and he came back. I could have counted him like 17 times, I didn't, I only counted them once. Um, there were three chickadees that were doing a similar sort of uh, to and fro over at the black oil sunflower tube feeder. Um, I only saw three, uh, the most that I saw at one time was three. Uh, but you end up uh, putting your data uh, into a list that is hosted on that website that we talk about sometimes, ebird.org, um, and you uh, you can add a little note if you want to. Um, you, yesterday, as you recall, it wasn't that, that pleasant out. Um, I watched our feeders for an hour and the activity came in waves and it was pretty much the same cast of characters each time. Um, they would come, they would feed, they would go back to wherever they're hang, hanging out. They'd warm up and they'd come back and they'd feed and then they'd go away, warm up. Um, and this happened several times over the course of uh, that hour that I was counting, and then it continued to happen. I kind of set up shop there at Hickory Knolls with my laptop, and I was going through emails, um, and I sort of got busy doing work, um, had a kind of a, a weird feeling. Um, I looked over one time, and I was being watched by uh, this guy here, so I started watching him back. This is a fox squirrel. The, um, you can kind of see here in the picture on the left, there's some, so, some large oak trees that are very close to the nature center, some big old bur oak trees. So one of those bur oak trees has a very large cavity in it. And we've had fox squirrels living in that cavity um, as long as I can remember, well, as long as Hickory Knolls has been there and they probably predate the nature center being there. So um, it was having a good old time and you know, when you put out bird seed, you can't just say, sorry, birds, or sorry, squirrels, this is for the birds. You're, you're kind of issuing an invitation to whoever um, wants to come and try and eat. They're, and squirrels, of course, are famous for their acrobatics and trying to um, get to that uh, delightful treat that's um, put out for free. <laughs> so uh, I went back to my work and then I got another weird feeling. And I looked up in this character. Now, he was a little late. He missed out on the fox squirrel. Um, in fact, he missed out on everything. <laughs> um, he hung out for, he or she, I should say, uh, hung out for, I don't know, between five and 10 minutes. Did a little preening, um, was keeping careful eye on me and then uh, took off again. This is a red-tailed hawk. Uh, we can tell it's a red tail, uh, one from that, that stocky, uh, the husky body shape. Um, a Cooper's hawk would have a much slimmer sort of a profile. Now, keep in mind this time of year, birds do puff up quite a bit because of the cold, but um, 
a, a Cooper's hawk would have more uh, in the way of a pattern. If it was a, a young Cooper's hawk, it would have brown streaks going down the breast here. And if it was a mature Cooper's hawk, it would have kind of orange bars going uh, horizontally across the chest. Um, and it would also have a, a longer uh, occipiter kind of tail. They're sort of like the fighter pilots of the, uh, the hawk world. So our uh, husky red tail hung out just long enough that I got, uh, got to look at him or her and he or she got to look at me and then off it went again. I believe this was a mature bird because its eyes were quite dark. Um, and the bird, as they get older, their eyes get darker. Um, it took off. I was curious to see where it um, flew towards. And of course, I uh, looked away at the wrong time and I, I missed the direction that it went. I suspect, though, that this is part of the pair that uh, always nests over in the natural area, uh, just west of the nature center. Now, um, Great Backyard Bird Count is over, but there's another ongoing uh, citizen science effort that you might want to check out. Uh, it's called Project, Project Feeder Watch, and it has a, a similar uh, sort of um, uh, method to it. Uh, and in fact, there's the instructions at the bottom. Put up a feeder, count the birds, enter your data. And entering the data, that's really the key to just about every citizen science effort. Um, you put your data in and then you want to make sure that you do it again and again and again and again. Those data, if you could think of those data sets as little snapshots of what's going on at a particular moment in time, that's going to tell you some information. But when you do that regularly, whether it's weekly um, or monthly uh, with the Great Backyard Bird Count, it's annually. But year after year after year, those data sets will start to paint a picture of what's going on. Are the numbers going up? Are the numbers going down? Um, and it's it, you can't really derive that from, say, one year to the next or one data set to the next. You really need a lot of data to be able to perceive trends. Uh, but anyway, this is a, a, a neat way to help out a, a larger effort. Um, and um, also, you get to you watch birds. What could be better than that? Well, actually, I can think of one thing that's at least as good as that, and that is watching uh, what lives in the water around here. Um, I received an email from uh, Illinois River Watch, and they have released their annual report, um, and they actually uh, listed the healthiest streams of 2020. And you know what got number one? This was so cool. It's Pearson Creek. Um, Dennis Kania, who used to work here at uh, the St. Charles Park District, and Renee Frigo, who actually also used to work here at the St. Charles Park District and now is in Glen Ellen, uh, they have been monitoring Fearson Creek. And here's what I was talking about with data. Um, if you send in data, it looks like we had a little bit of a gap here, but um, uh, data year after year, um, Put together will give you a more complete picture of what's going on, uh, whether you're looking at uh, birds or macroinvertebrates or butterflies or, or whatever the citizen science happens to be. So um, yeah, this was kind of neat, um, and I was I was really hoping that in as an accompaniment to this announcement that I'd be able to say, oh, and River Watch is holding a training here in King County. Um, the closest. Uh, Riverwatch training for any of you interested in, in becoming a uh, river watcher for uh, your contribution to citizen science. The closest one is in Genoa, and that one is already full. But uh, you can look up Illinois River Watch, maybe send them an email. They might have an, uh, an online component, or they, they might be able to have another way to get you involved if, if that's something you want to do. Um, Monitoring streams involves actually going out and getting in the water, looking at its physical characteristics, what the substrate is, what the, um, the usage around it is. Is it agricultural? Is it uh, next to a golf course? Is it in a park? Um, yeah, how fast is it flowing? You take some measurements of velocity and, and how turbid or cloudy it is. Uh, but then you also sample the creatures that live in it. And that's where this data comes from. 
you see that there's reference to uh, EPT, which you may have heard that abbreviation before. In this case, it uh, refers to Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera, which are the mayflies, the stoneflies, and the caddisflies. And who are they? They're these guys. Um, on the left, now there's many, 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 I want to say there's like 500 and some different types of mayflies uh, in North America. This is just one example. And um, uh, what Dennis and Renee were looking at would be the, uh, the larval or the immature forms of these insects. But this was, this was a, a mayfly larva. We actually found several of these in uh, Fearson Creek. Um, a few years ago when we had our summer camp kids there, that would be called a burrowing mayfly. Uh, and they turn into uh, these large dark mayflies here. Uh, Hexagenia is, this, is the genus, I'm not sure of the species, but they're, they're pretty large. They're kind of hard to miss. Uh, we tend to see them in June uh, in, uh, around Pottawatomie Park. Um, you might also see mayflies that look like this. Uh, I took this picture right here outside of Good Nature World Headquarters on Walnut Street in downtown St. Charles. Um, so mayflies can take many different forms. Like I said, there's lots of different species, but the fact that we're finding them in Fearson Creek means that the water quality um, is sufficient for them to survive. These little immature insects here live in the water. They breathe with gills here on this mayfly. The whole abdomen here is gills pumping water. So they need to be able to breathe. Uh, they need to have well oxygenated water in order to be able to survive. Uh, who's even fussier than the mayflies are these guys here, the stoneflies. This is uh, a stonefly nymph that we found uh, in Fearson Creek as well. Now, this adult here is not, these are two completely different species. I'm not sure uh, what kind of uh, stonefly nymph this is, but this adult here, it's, yes, that's snow. This is a winter stonefly. Um, this was uh, right outside of Creek Bend Nature Center uh, and on warm winter days. Stoneflies have a, adult stoneflies have a kind of a cool mating ritual. Uh, they use the, their abdomen here uh, in the Circe to drum the substrate that they're on. And um, the males drum in one fashion and the females form uh, drum in another fashion and they find each other and they make more stoneflies. Now the T in EPT is Trichoptera, um, which means uh, scaly wing. I'm sorry, um, uh, hairy wing is Lepidoptera. These guys are actually um, very closely related and they think, uh, scientists think that they may share a common ancestor with our Lepidopterans, which are our butterflies and our moths. Um, but they, you can see that the, the larva of the caddisfly looks sort of caterpillar-like. Uh, some live uh, freely in the water. Uh, they might spin a web to attach themselves to uh, a rock. They might also glue little bits of substrate together, little bits of sand or stones and um, make themselves a little house because this uh, soft body here, just like the caterpillars that we have on land, this soft abdomen is very tasty to any number of different creatures. Um, this also happens to be what um, many people refer to as the river bugs when they come out just as with the stoneflies and the mayflies, when the adults emerge from the water, um, they do it in mass. And the um, caddisflies will have uh, several emergences over the course of the summer, and we might have hundreds of thousands, we might have millions coming out at uh, one time, uh, to the point where we're, we're sweeping them up uh, here outside of Good Natured World Headquarters. But um, caddisflies, uh, also need they're a little bit more tolerant. Uh, certain species are a little bit more tolerant of pollution, but they too need clean water. So the fact that we're finding them is very good. Uh, good sign for our local water race. Um, all right, now I'm just hot dogging it. These were a couple of other, uh, this is another example of just how diverse the caddis flies in our area are. Uh, this was um, on the left. This is a case made by a species of caddisfly that lives in very still water, which would be the uh, ephemeral wetlands behind hickory knolls. 
And then on the right, this is what it emerged into. This is a very large species of caddisfly. Something to look for. Uh, if you happen to find yourself uh, out at Hickory Knolls in uh, late spring and early summer, look for these bits of plant material. Um, it almost looks like just debris on the, uh, either in the substrate of the pond or sometimes they're up towards the surface, just looks like they're floating along. If you look more closely, you see that there is purpose to the movement because the larva is inside there and it's um, moving itself along and feeding on um, plant material and other things. But anyway, EPT, Ephemeraptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera, the um, mayflies, the stoneflies, and the caddisflies, all keys to uh, determining how healthy our waterways are. Now, this uh, photo came from uh, Bob and Kathy Andrini, another little mystery in the snow. But if we look more closely at it, you can probably guess that this was the landing spot of, I'm gonna guess, Bob and Kathy, I don't know, I didn't ask you what the waterfowl was, but I was gonna guess it was a duck coming in for a landing. Uh, duck or goose, you can see they, you know, they normally, they come in and they, they kind of backpedal there with their wings and they, they I have this long, almost like a seaplane you know, landing uh, on water. Well, they can land on uh, ice too. And then they probably walk away and act like nothing happened. Like they just, they meant to do that. Kind of a cool sign, almost as good as the, uh, well, I'd say equally as good as the, uh, the snow angels that you can look for when uh, raptors dive after prey in snow. Very cool. Um, now, speaking of ducks, um, we have a, a, a walking group here that uh, at the park district, they've actually branched out a little bit. Sometimes they go to forest preserves. Lately, they've been walking a lot at, a lot at Mount St. Mary's because the paths there are somewhat plowed. And they can also divert uh, and walk uh, through downtown St. Charles as well. Well, the, um, the people in the group the other day, they said, hey, Pam, can you go and check out this duck that's um, near the, the pedestrian bridge? Uh, just south of um, the Illinois Street Bridge in downtown St. Charles. I said, well, sure. So I went over there. Well, you can see we've got kind of a, a mix here. We've got some Canada geese and we've got some mallards. Well, look really closely here. Right here in the middle of the screen, there is a tiny little duck. Now, the people that pointed it out in our walking group, they said it looks like a baby. And what did we just say about screech owls? If it's big enough to fly, it's not a baby. It's an adult. Um, might not be fully mature, but it's um, it's as big as it's going to get. And here it comes paddling along. Um, the uh, the walkers said that uh, the the bigger birds kind of seem to be watching out for it. And they want to know what it was. Well, that um, here's a better look at it. Here, look how small it is full size or full grown adult duck. Um, this is actually uh, a female bufflehead. Um, bufflehead's, uh, we see them here in the winter time. They are um, sometimes confused with uh, golden eyes, but when you put them side by side here, you can see the difference. Plus golden eyes, eyes have, are golden. <laughs> um, but they, uh, they, they look like they've got a, a dabbling sort of a bill, um, like they'd feed on the surface, but they actually dive down and they will um, get their food underneath the water. So you'll see them and then all of a sudden it disappears and then 10, 15, 20 feet later, it pops back up again. So that's a female bufflehead that was hanging out there with the, the geese and the, uh, the mallard ducks. Um, something kind of cool about the buffleheads, here's their range map. So you can see they're here in the winter and then they go north to nest. They are cavity nesters and they prefer to nest in the holes. There's that bird we were talking about earlier, of flickers. Sometimes they'll use the hole uh, created by a pileated woodpecker, but they, they have shown a distinct preference for uh, nesting in uh, the cavities that were created by northern flickers. So kind of a cool relationship there. And it, um, something that we probably won't see in this area. You can see um, you know, their, their nesting occurs quite a bit north of us, but um, this is also sort of a limited time engagement as we get towards the end of February and into March. 
uh, those buffleheads and those golden eyes and regancers, all of those birds that are here just in the wintertime are going to be taken off for points north. Now, um, this is also uh, courtesy of uh, Bob and Kathy Andrini. They um, took a trip out to Fulton, Illinois, which is about uh, two hours west of here on the Mississippi River. Uh, they shared some wonderful photos of bald eagles. Here we've got um, our uh, mature bald eagle with the white head and the white tail here on the left. And then here we've got some immature birds uh, here on the right. You can see they've got, um, the patterns on a, an eagle will change many times between its its first year out of the nest and about its fifth year when it attains its its um, adult plumage. But I guess you could call these baby eagles, even though they are fully flighted, they are still what we, they're, they're immature. Uh, they're not going to get that white head until uh, about their fifth year. Um, so these guys were out uh, hunting, uh, grabbing fish, feeding, having a good old time there on the Mississippi. Bob and Kathy were also lucky enough to catch the threesome. Remember we talked about these guys, uh, was it just last week? Um, uh, Valor and Valor 2 and Star. Um, these are the, the two males and uh, female, single female, well, she's not single, she's got two, <laughs> two mates, uh, but the three of them uh, cooperate to raise um, their young every year. So that was a cool capture too, and a nice uh, uh, reference to um, what we talked about uh, in another good natured hour. So yeah, if you get a chance, head on out there. Um, it's a uh, neat, it's by Lock and Dam uh, 13 and uh, uh, Upper Mississippi, uh, um, Conservancy group uh, keeps a close watch on these three, and you can too. Now, uh, taking a step back in time, um, I came across this. I can't remember what I was looking up, and I thought, you know, I wonder how many people have heard about this. This was something I learned about shortly after I started working at the St. Charles Park District. Um, that there's actually a little bit of Kane County history housed down in the Illinois State Museum in Springfield. Um, it is a hunk of stag moose, looks like this, and it was found here. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Biddle family. They have a very large farm out on um, Captain Hills Road uh, just before you hit Anderson. And back in the uh, Oh gosh, the 1980s, because this, this um, uh, stag moose antler was, was discovered by the museum people uh, in 1989. Uh, and it's, it's been, uh, the, the Biddles handled, handed it over to the state and it's been as part of their collection now for many years. But it was found, I think it was when they were digging uh, a pond, it might even have been this pond here, but they, they dug up um, the remains of uh, this stag moose. Uh, stag moose is an extinct, they were part of the, um, uh, the Ice Age megafauna that roamed around here, uh, along with the, uh, the mastodons that we sometimes uh, hear getting dredged up when somebody's digging for a project. Um, the stag moose favored the sort of habitat that our modern moose does. They, they like to uh, they have woods nearby. They like to be near wetlands. Um, they will feed in water. Um, and the um, thought that there was one stag moose here, there's probably others too. So if, you know, if you've got a, a project you've been thinking about doing where you're going to be doing some digging, uh, you, you just never know what you're going to find. Uh, it's just a, a, a neat little piece of history and uh, a gee whiz thing, if, if it can happen here on the Biddle Farm, it could be happening all over um, the stretch of uh, Captain Hills Road, in fact, the west side of St. Charles. So um, anyway, stag moose uh, from Kane County are part of the collection down at the Illinois State Museum. Kind of neat, huh? 10,000 years ago, these guys went extinct. Now, this was an email uh, that I received, uh, I think it was the end of last week. 
And this woman lives out in, uh, in Richmond and uh, she's noticed that she's, they you know, looked at different tracks over the years and they've mostly been able to either uh, identify them or they've been able to see the animal that was making them. And I, I tell you, when she sent this, these photos that she sent, my, my heart kind of skipped a beat at first. I looked at that and I go, holy cats, that looks like what you'd see when an otter is moving through the snow. So um, my first thought was, hmm, I wonder if she lives near water. Well, then um, I read a little bit more about what she said. And she said that the, um, that little groove in the snow there is about four inches wide. Well, otters are more than four inches wide. Uh, and then she said the tracks in the rut are about an inch and a half uh, in length and width. So um, that's a little small for an otter too. But you know what else will uh, move through the snow like that? Our mink. Um, here's a couple other uh, photos of the animal moving through the snow. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of a drag here in between the tracks. Now, if this was, um, I would say, a, a fox, I don't think we'd have this much snow plowed off on either side. If it was a raccoon, we'd be seeing the, the um, feet matching up uh, the front and hind feet would be side by side because of the way the raccoon moves through the snow. Plus raccoons are a heck of a lot wider than four inches as well. So uh, the diagnosis here was that um, this family in Richmond had a mink that crossed uh, through their property. Now I asked her, I asked her about water because mink do hang out by water, but I also asked her if they have chickens. And she said she doesn't, but their neighbors do. So I kind of wonder if maybe this mink was uh, maybe um, um, had a, a, a taste for uh, some poultry and made its way uh, through the land. It's hard to tell. And of course, now with the latest blast of winter that we've had, these tracks have all been covered up. But um, anyway, kind of makes you wonder and um, kind of makes me hopeful that um, We'll be getting um, uh, more, uh, hearing about more tracks like this, and maybe someday uh, one of them will be showing us the tracks of an otter. One of these days. <laughs> now, um, I know we've got some some U of I grads in the audience. Um, I know I'm a U of I grad. I remember uh, the first insect fear film festival that occurred at U of I. It was in um, uh, 1984 and it was at the auditorium. Well, every year since then, this event has occurred and it's happening. Well, actually I take that, no, no, it did happen last year. I was gonna go last year and then something came up. It's, this is, um, it's, a, it's a quirky little um, activity that occurs at the last Saturday in February every year. And it's held, they said, in the auditorium. It's put on by uh, the Entomology Grad Student Association. But uh, really, the, the architect behind the entire event is a woman named Dr. Mae Berenbaum. Um, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Berenbaum. She uh, is gifted with the ability to explain entomology in very understandable terms. She's got a number of books uh, about um, different topics in the bug world. And she's, uh, she's a, got a, a wonderful sense of humor too. She always acts as kind of like the, the MC uh, at Insect Fear. Um, the idea behind it is to make uh, insects more approachable, but she does it by playing on uh, the fear that is created by what Hollywood has made our insects out to be, whether it's the giant uh, praying mantis that's trying to eat Tokyo. I think the last time I went, uh, the theme was, was flaming cockroaches in the movie. It's all these, these you know, kind of maybe lower rated films. I don't know that we'll get four star types of cinema at these events, but um, the, uh, the movie, uh, I remember watching 
involved uh, an earthquake in California that angered some cockroaches that lived in the uh, towards the center of the earth and they came crawling out of this big fault that had opened up and, and would wreak havoc in different towns. Uh, and, and I think there was a scientist involved too who had been doing some cockroach research. So anyway, it's it's fun to watch these movies. Um, it's also fun to, to go to the event because it's not just the film itself um, and it's not just Dr. Berenbaum, but uh, the, the grad students uh, go all out to show what they're up to. The different students will have displays on what they're researching. There's lots of different things to touch and interact with. And in one year they had a, um, a uh, horseshoe crab petting pool. Uh, somebody was investigating something with horseshoe crabs. Uh, you can hold a tarantula. Um, they've got um, examples of some of their, uh, their micron microscope photography that they do. Uh, the local stool, uh, students, um, not the university students, but the, the grade school and the high school students around Champaign-Urbana also compete in an insect art contest. So it's a really fun thing. I'm uh, probably uh, talking way too long about it, but it is fun. And if you're not doing anything the last Saturday in February, maybe uh, plan a trip down to the old CU and uh, see what, uh, maybe I'll see you there. I'm still trying to decide if I'm going or not this year. Um, you can find out about it. Easiest way is to um, just type Insect Fear Film Festival into your favorite search engine. It'll come up there. You can also look for them on Twitter and on Facebook. Now with that, um, uh, we've got a couple of things that we'll be looking at next week. Uh, I've heard from so many people who are questioning the robins that we're seeing at this time of year and what's wrong with them, what's wrong with our planet, why are we seeing robins? Robins aren't supposed to be here yet. They are a sign of spring. Well, as you'll see next week, um, they're not really the most reliable signs of spring. There are some others that are gonna give you a truer sense of what's going on. Um, we're gonna run down our, our top 10 favorite signs of spring. Uh, we've got some more fun emails that we'll take a look at and who knows what's gonna happen in the week ahead. Now with that, I'm gonna turn it down here. We're gonna stop our share. And I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Does anybody have any questions? Anything to report from the field? Things that you've noticed this week? Um, anybody? Hi, Pam. It's Kay. Oh, hey, Kay. How are you? All right. How are you doing? I'm good. Um, I was wondering, um, the newspaper slots, almost like a mailbox, Oftentimes I've seen in there a nest built and it mm. almost seems as if it was a screech owl by let's say the twigs that I've seen in other pictures. I tried Googling it, of course, uh -huh. and I didn't really find anything on it. But uh, one time I actually saw, or a neighbor saw in there an, a small owl. So it probably was a screech owl. And then oftentimes at a place I used to go off and, in that newspaper slot, there was, and the twigs were larger, so it wasn't okay. like a whole robin's nest or something like that, and they were just kind of sparse all over the whole box, if you will. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Um, any chance? It it could be. Um, without seeing a, a photo of it, it'd be hard to say for sure. Yeah. I, I think they certainly would look at that as a cavity. Um, the um. Uh, I've heard about uh, tree swallows. Okay. Yeah. In, what, um, there's plenty where I would see them. And um, uh, eastern bluebirds. I think. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, we did a class on nests um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, we talked a little bit about uh, a, a bluebirds. You know, everybody likes to put up bluebird houses, but. Um, they're cavity nesters. So before there were bluebird houses, they would um, you know, nest in trees and they actually had a preference for um, a broken off branch. So they were nesting in a kind of a horizontal tube, which okay. 
exactly what you're describing. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, they weren't that common in the area that I, I kept seeing it. Okay. Um, but, yeah, it would be interesting. To, you think it might, uh, when was the last time you saw it? Was it this past summer or? Um, repetitively. We used to go to a place up north, in, just into Wisconsin somewhat. So, okay. Um, but we don't go there anymore. So I probably saw it repetitively excluding the last two summers. Um, each summer there was those twigs within the box itself. Okay. And yeah. Was... Bizarre, bigger twigs. That's kind of what, and I never thought about it till, you know, reading up on screech owls and things. Yeah. Now, um, I don't know how much effort a screech owl puts into, to adding to the, right. um, um, but it might be worth, uh, you know, investigating some more. I wonder if it might also have been a wren that moved in there because they, they okay. use a lot of sticks as part of their nest building. Um, yeah. And it was a very wooded area, so it could have almost been okay. a bird per se. Okay. Well, uh, it reminds me, um, one of the uh, senior living communities that I go to for our, our outreach programs, uh, the activity director said that they were having a big problem in her subdivision because a door had fallen off one of the male receptacle things and some tree swallows had moved in and they were diving on people every time <laughs> they you know, tried to get their mail. Um, the swallows were being very you know, protective as they should be, you know, they're, they've got a family there they're trying to protect, but it was um, adding to the, uh, if it wasn't, you know, hard enough to walk to the mailbox every day, they had to then dive all the efforts of these um, very protective swallow parents. And bar our purple martins are the same way, uh, very yeah. protective. Yeah, who can blame them, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good question, Kay. So Pam, yeah. can you hear me? It's Julie. Oh yeah, hey Julie. I put a note up there. I have just bought two boxes, two owl boxes from John Hennigan. He built them for me. Oh yeah, okay. And he uh, has all these special techniques that are actually better than what you can get with most of them. Um, and he also made mine to special specifications because I had him put a highly slanted roof on the top of it to try to keep okay. the squirrels off. Okay. And then my husband covered in, in metal flashing. So we're waiting to see if we can keep the squirrels out. But he did say, I said, are you willing? Someone has already asked me if he would make something for him, for them. And he said, yes, he would. Now he's charging $85 because the cedar and the materials are so expensive. But, but if anybody is wanting a really high quality screech owl box and also the chance to see his screech owls at his house, <laughs> they could probably contact you or me for his phone number. Yes, yeah, if anybody is, um, I'd be glad to act as an intermediary for that too. But he, um, uh, like I said, we've got these, these future stories with John coming up where he had this whole thing with uh, northern flickers and uh, screech owls going on in his yard. And um, he's, the observations he's been able to make are really fascinating. Um, so yeah, if you uh, want something uh, from the master. <laughs> um, right, yeah. And yeah. also I had a screech owl, um, Bob and Kathy, what was that, a week and a half ago? It, oh, came, yeah. it came for one day and Kathy and Chris got to see it and the squirrels have chased it out again. They oh. were in there. The, now this was not in my John Hennigan boxes. This is not other box. Okay. But they had, uh, squirrels had been in it and then the owl came in. We were all so excited. And then the squirrel's back. In fact, he's just running right over all these spikes I have on it, filling the <laughs> thing with so many leaves, the leaves are coming out of the hole. I oh, can't boy. blame him because it's so cold that I go out and bang on it with my broom handle and try to get him out of there. 
But He's John did you. say, well, John said not to give up. He said the owls can, they seem to uh, chase the squirrels out occasionally. So okay, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful, but. Now, um, did you have a red uh, screech, Julie, or, or a gray? No, it was gray. You had a gray one, okay. We just sat in the sun, south facing house in the sun for the whole afternoon. Oh, how fun. And then he went away. But I'm hoping it comes back. That he'll come back. Yeah. I'm I'm hoping. Hoping. Rolling Cam out the red carpet. Cam and Julie. Um, this is Diane. Hi, um, Diane. What are your landscape requirements to have a screech owl box? Uh, what do you mean? I mean, do you need a nearby woodland or I mean? Well, I have my, my problem is I have a woodland. And so that's why I can't keep the squirrels out of it. I have to put them on a tree. I want them on a south facing side of a tree well, you, I mean you know Julie what my backyard is like I mean right but John's backyard I mean people I know have them on posts you know on poles or posts okay and then they actually don't have the squirrel issue as long as you can keep them from going up that post okay because so I don't have a lot of woodland cover that's what I, why I was asking the question um you know I all you can do is try it um okay. They yeah, might, they might like your wetland. Right. <laughs> well, John was saying how his seemed to have a, a taste for frogs. And um, they have and, plenty of frogs. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, if there's woods not too far away, Diane, because they, they, they look for cavities. Mm -hmm. So um, if there's, you know, woods down the road, um, well, the woods would be on the others. I, I live on uh, the Bulkham Road Wetlands Preserve. So, okay. but on my side, there are no trees. I mean, other than what's in my yard, and we have planted a lot of trees. But, but you. on the other side of the wetlands, there are there's quite a few trees. But that's across the. But I would think he might come swooping over your wetland looking for frogs, and maybe he'll like your. Sure. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I'll I try it. That sounds great. Yeah. John's more of an expert than I am. And okay. <laughs> I think well, we're all learning about well, screech owls. Say, just to go and see the um, his screech owls would be a treat. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you have to, I guess you have to have special permission or buy a box from him or something because he's okay. not <laughs> apparently anxious to have the entire world down there. Yeah, from I, I I <laughs> okay. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Pam. Yeah. Sure. Anybody else? Hey, Pam, it's Laura. Hey, um, I, I was going back to the Fearsome Creek with Renee and Dennis, and I remember, um, and I don't know if I was right or not, but when we take our, our nature camp guys out there, the mm -hmm. kids, um, we catch um, what we thought were the Helgramite. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. are those... Uh, I'm pretty sure that's what they were. Are those a pretty good sign for a healthy creek then? They, too? they are. Yeah. The, so that that EPT index is kind of um, those are found pretty much everywhere. But the the Helgramite well, that's that's the um, mature form of the uh, Dobson fly. Oh, okay. They're they're very fussy. Um, in fact, they. Uh, it's funny, I was just doing some, some proofreading for an interpretive sign for a local agency and they, they're putting the sign up by their retention pond and they were talking about aquatic environments and they pictured this, this they had a picture of this Helgramite, but um, Helgramites need, a, also called toe biters, they also, because <laughs> um, of those, those big jaws. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They need uh, highly oxygenated water, so strong flowing waterways. So they're they're not really a pond species. So I, I ask if we could they, were, they could switch out that picture for maybe uh, like a, you know a diving beetle or a, um, a water scorpion or something that likes a stiller environment. But yeah, helger mites are um, there's there's those um, pollution tolerance charts. That, yeah, um, they'll have uh, the at the top the the group uh, that is the least tolerant of pollution. Helgramites mites are always up there. They're up there with the stoneflies and um, uh, 
but it, it's it's funny though like there mayflies there's some mayflies that are very um uh fussy and then there's other ones that are not so fussy um and yet they are you know all lumped into the same order um same with freshwater mussels there's some freshwater mussels that need very very clean water and only a couple different fish species disperse their young on but um, then there's other species that um, will live in, um, you know, the muck above a dam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you, Pam. Yeah. Sure. Good question. Anybody else? If not, well, um, happy Tuesday, everybody. We made it through uh, the latest start. I, I saw that we were, um, when are we at? 38 inches of snow since January. So, and it's not over yet. So um, keep the faith. Spring is uh, only 50, did I hear 58 days away? Um, I don't know, I kind of am enjoying this. If we're gonna have winter, we may as well have snow too. So um, enjoy it, be careful out there. I hope to see you back. Have a good night, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.